Well, here's the movie scene, right? You can picture along in your mind as I, as I read here. Connor, who is an immortal guy, is banished from his little Scottish village. And so his love, Heather, runs away from the village to live with him in exile up in the, up in the highlands. And in this story, these immortal people can't have children. And that's important because what follows in the movie then is a montage of their life together as she grows old and he doesn't. As the great rock power ballad, Who Wants to Live Forever, plays in the background until poor Heather finally dies of old age. It's an exceptionally moving scene for a rather violent and a little bit corny 80s action movie. In 1986, the rock band Queen released that song, Who Wants to Live Forever, as a single from the soundtrack of that film. And the song quickly became a favorite for both uh, fans of the band and fans of the movie. And Brian May's lyrics and score, along with Freddie Mercury's one-of-a-kind voice, capture that bitter sweetness, desiring a moment to last forever, and yet knowing that a moment can't bear the weight of that forever. I mean, just what would we humans do with forever if we found it? Because the best we humans can think of when it comes to forever is just a really, really, really long time. So why this forever talk? Well, Jesus speaks of living forever and what do you do forever? And perhaps if we even have time this morning, what then is forever? So before we jump into that, though, we need to understand sort of what we're getting into with this Bible story. See, Jesus speaks of living and eating of his flesh and blood. Now, is all that a metaphor? Well, not really. I mean, it is symbolic. Jesus speaks of giving his flesh for the life of the world, which he certainly does on the cross and which he does in Holy Communion and as he does with uh, the body of baptized believers, right? That's us. Winning and giving and spreading, all three ways. His forgiveness, new life, and salvation across time and space. So those aren't metaphors. They're literal, they're physical, they're symbolic and they're spiritual, but they're not materialist in the biology class sense of the word, for lack of a better word. See, Jesus adds that eating his flesh, eating, his, his, eating and drinking his body and blood causes him to abide in us and we in him. We hear that again in chapter 15 as well. So much like that old communion prayer goes, that we may eat his flesh and drink his blood, that he may have more dwell in us and we in him. It says Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, right? Then to have him abiding in us and in him means that we have the power of his endless life in us. Or in other words, we're really and truly living now with him because before we were not living without him, which is not how our culture today would typically think about such things. Now, if you spend enough time on the internet, you'll come across those Silicon Valley bigwigs who think that eternal life is just a technical problem, right? They just say that with enough knowledge and enough application, they will come up with a material solution to the problem of so-called natural death. Now, some of their ideas are weird. Others are downright gross and shameful, right? Like taking transfusions of bodily fluids from children. And others still sound more like uh, fiction than science, such as uploading their minds into the computing cloud, which at least one presidential candidate thinks is up here and exists above us. Now, one of these tech gurus even thinks that at least at this step in the world, that it's mostly a problem of optimization. Calories, rest, exercise, nutrients. And he posts all of his findings for free on the internet so that to encourage you to join with him and together you can achieve eternal life. 
And while these guys might be a little extreme in their conclusions, they're simply the logical end product of our health and wellness industry, from the food and drug companies all the way to the various lifestyle influencers and branding. So I suppose these worldly types are motivated in some sense with the notion that they only get one shot at this. And so they better do their best to succeed. Right? However they measure success, hedonism, gluttony, lust, curiosity, wrath, power, all those ways that we use our very good bodies in very bad ways. And so it goes when life is approached primarily from the angle of scarcity and maximization. That is, we've only got a little bit of life and it's running out. So we better be efficient and effective. And certainly we Christians can fall to these very same temptations. <coughs> However, as Christians, we're motivated hopefully. Right? We're motivated with the promise of the resurrection of our bodies. Just as Jesus promises to raise them up on the last day in verse 54 of the gospel. And whatever our renewed bodies look like, whatever perfect, perfected properties they have, they are still bodies, actual physical bodies, as evidenced by Jesus' own actual physical resurrected and ascended body. See, the new age of Aquarius, Woodstock, the summer of love, all things before my time, <laughs> right? All those notions that our bodies are not really us and that when we die, they don't matter anymore, all that is sin and requires Repentance. Yeah, as Christians know, we can't live forever, just as Queen sings about and Silicon Valley strives for. No matter what we do, death will come for us in our sins in this earthly life. And hence those very old Christian prayers for the dying. That we be spared from suffering and unprepared and evil death. And then following death, the insistence that the deceased is now at rest from his labors in this life, including the labored and toilsome illness that so often precedes death. See, the way we talk about these things matters, right? It's not a case of potato, potato. Anyway, as we continue our focus these few Sundays on the body of Christ, or to put it another way, the individual bodies of the body of Christ and the other individual bodies served by the body of Christ. So as we focus on that, perhaps we begin to see that Christians have different motivations for health and wellness and human flourishing, quite different from the ones we find around us. And so for us Christians, we aren't trying to cheat death or make it irrelevant. And we're also not trying to speed it up. No, for us, health and well-being in this earthly life are opportunities for us to bring out the healing and salvation won for us on the cross, to witness to the new creation and the new life it brings, to show and tell about God's love, to promote human flourishing, life and living as not only worthwhile, but as ordered toward, as St. Paul writes today, what is good and right and true. So as Christians, we know that eternal life starts with this life, just as Jesus says in verse 54, those who eat my flesh and drink my blood have eternal life. Not will have, but have as now from Jesus. Which brings us back around to the beginning in that Queen song. Who wants to live forever? Well, Christians do. Because that's God's intention for us, to live under him in his kingdom and to serve him in everlasting righteousness, innocence, and blessedness, as the small catechism puts it. But what do we do with our forever, now and later? Now we have to oversimplify here for a quick minute. Countless books and essays have been written about this. We only get a sentence or two. But forever is not a really, really, really long time. Forever doesn't have any time. It just is, as God is. It's not frozen in time the way we say, I, I wish this moment could last forever. It's consciousness beyond the reach of time, always present, never past or future. That we might get a very, very dim glimpse of something like this, say when we're at a concert, 
when we're singing along with hundreds or thousands of our new closest friends and our favorite performers. We're all in song together, and we forget entirely. In fact, we almost transcend momentarily the passage of time. So what do we do with our very real forever as it comes to us now and later? Well, St. Paul tells us in Ephesians 4, Live as children of the light, in verse 8. Wake up, in verse 14, to what Jesus gives us in his own body and blood. Forgiveness, new life, and salvation. Be filled with the Spirit, in verse 18. Sing, in verse 19. Give thanks to the Lord, in verse 20. And be subject, or serve one another in reverence for Jesus, in verse 21. This is what Christians are concerned with in the health and well-being of our physical bodies. See, we need these bodies to do those things that St. Paul spells out. We need these bodies to show and tell others about doing those things with bodies. See, too often we Christians fall for the world's lie that religion is, is something inside you that you can take too far if it gets out into our actual bodies. But our eternal life has already begun in this life on earth. And how do we live this life on earth without our earthly bodies? It makes you wonder. Everyday life is the beginning of eternal life. Just as Jesus came to bring eternal life in the everyday lives of the people in John 6, and just as Jesus bids us to eat and drink his body and blood in our everyday lives now, living as children of the light, we can't help but see the light of Christ shining, including shining on all the darkness and shadows that we attempt to keep around our own actual bodies. As St. Paul writes elsewhere, those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who are drunk, get drunk at night. And so with the gift of eternal life now, in everyday life, we take inventory of the light and the dark in our own physical lives and well-being. We ask ourselves things such as, what do I need to do to be healthy, to sing, and to give thanks? What can I do for another to make, help them become healthy, to sing and give thanks? What can I do to live temperately, moderately, not merely in food and drink, but in all things I consume, including my media? Where is the Lord waking me up to address something in flesh and blood everyday life that I haven't seen? or that I've ignored. If everyday life is the beginning of eternal life, and it is, then it's the beginning of living under Jesus in his kingdom and serving him with our flesh and blood bodies. And so in this sense, we truly are his body in the world for the sake of the world, shining his light into the world's darkness, teaching it to sing and to give thanks and to serve. And of course, to do that, we need healthy bodies of our own. That's our Christian motivation for wellness. And only in these heavenly ways does human life truly flourish here on earth. Amen.